This is another uh, piece that was found at Saqqara. If you look at the eyes of this statue, it looks like alive. Maybe the most beautiful wooden statue ever created by a human being. Okay, let's, uh, let's walk on then. Dr. Hawass has an interesting line on lessons for today from the pharaohs. This is, uh, this is beautiful, Mr. Hawass, isn't it? Yeah, this is another uh, famous uh, masterpiece in this museum, and it has a very interesting story. This king is meant to hot of the second, Nebet Hebetra. He's the one actually, you know, in ancient Egypt 4,000 years ago, it happened a revolution, like our revolution. There is a man, a writer, his name was Epwer. Uh, he tried to advise the king. The people around you are not good. They are corrupted. And the king never listened to me. Now tell me, are there any lessons from this period? Does, have this is the revolution, 4,000... Oh, the lesson, I'm telling you. Of, for today. I mean. I'm telling you, today, if you read what Epwer left to us, it is the most important lesson for everyone, for the ruler, for the people today to understand what do we need now? A strong king. The protesters certainly didn't want a strong king or indeed their president, Mubarak. They're proud that on Tahrir Square they had no leaders. During the revolution, the army was seen as protecting the protesters. Now it's in charge until the elections in September. There are still demonstrations every Friday on Tahrir Square. They're demanding that Mubarak be charged quickly and that the head of the army be sacked. Are there lessons you think that Egypt can learn from its history, from this revolution 4,000 years ago in which People demanded better conditions, the middle right, class right. demanded more. The worker strikes actually started back in, back in, um, in, in ancient uh, Egypt. I mean, there were, there were worker strikes and, there, and, and mind you, ancient Egypt wasn't, I mean, it was still a sort of an authoritarian regime. I mean, so we appreciate it and we value it for what it is, but no, we don't want another pharaoh. <laughs> In the time of the pharaohs, gods and leaders were aligned. The pharaohs joined the gods when they died. But on earth, they were responsible for the people. This pharaoh, Akhenaten, was something of a philosopher. In a culture that had many gods, he narrowed it down to one. The sun god was the only god, and the pharaoh his only guarantor. This is Akhenaten, and there is the sun. And the sun god, of course, was called Aten, and he changed his name to call himself Akhenaten, so that he was one and the same with the sun. This pharaoh was as bold and innovative in the arts as he was in philosophy. There's a new humanity in evidence. I love this little statuette. This is, this is Akhenaten with the little princess, his daughter. And of course, you think of the pharaohs as a, a sort of aloof, even intimidating figures. So this is a, a really special piece, capturing really this intimate moment of the father with his daughter. It's really, really beautiful. The uh, pharaoh was not just a king. He's, he was not just someone controlling the country. He was a symbol of the nation. He was connected strongly with the fertility of the land and the stabilization of the universe. This was the image of the Egyptian pharaoh. And uh, the people, the Egyptians, they trusted this pharaoh. You know, he was not a dictator. He was the one who can lead the country to the future. Most people in England, most of us think of the pharaohs as sort of 
authoritarian figures, they were the rulers. I mean, is that a wrong idea then, the sense that they were sort of totalitarian regimes, that they were in charge and... Yeah. So, well, there is one fact that dictatorship cannot build great civilizations. Gr dictatorship can build a huge building, but it was still ugly because the people who will build it, you know, they will build it without love. These pharaohs were not dictators. We hear that oh, the pharaohs used the people as slaves, which is not true. And that's the only reason they were able to build this great civilization. So it seems that the pyramids were not built by the anonymous slave-driven mass that Hollywood has created. Egypt, 50 centuries ago, slaves and generations of slaves pressed the rock from the unyielding earth. In fact, the workers were fed, housed, and even given medical care. If this was a dictatorship, it was more benign and inclusive than we'd been led to believe. Armies of wretched humanity suffered and died to haul their colossal burden across the desert to the River Nile. The giant stones to build the pyramids were floated down the Nile, and for three months of the year when the Nile flooded and the farmers couldn't work their fields, they were redeployed to work on the pyramids. It was a kind of ancient job creation scheme. It rises from the desert floor as the mightiest monument ever erected to the glory of one man. And look what they created. This is it, the Pyramid of Pyramids, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. It was named after King Cheops, the pharaoh of the Old Kingdom. It's 146 meters high, two million separate slabs of limestone. It was a feat of extraordinary organization, of mathematical precision and huge, huge construction requirements. But Cheops, the builder of the biggest pyramid of them all, is commemorated by only one statue, and it's one of the tiniest objects in the museum. So this is the famous Cheops? Yeah. Although the statue, little statue, but very important, very, very important. It's so amazing, but it's so tiny, and yet yeah. he was this great builder of the biggest pyramid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the face, fantastic face. Yeah. Although the face is very small, but look, if you look at him, you find the statue looks at you, look. And it's in this tiny little box, yeah. with a little lock on it. <laughs> The pyramids weren't just monuments to the pharaohs. They were a collective hope for the future and a celebration of everyday life. And so here, these are the servants, is that right? Yeah, the servants, yeah. And this, yeah, everyone, yeah. everyone of these servants makes something, yeah. He makes something. Look, yeah, this one makes um, beer. 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 Yeah, beer, yeah. He's yeah. pressing the hops. Yeah. And he's cooking. He's cooking. Yeah. She is. He's cooking now. That's a she, I think, <laughs> you're fine, is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, oh, lady, yeah. Yeah. She is cooking, you know. This one also, maybe go to the market to get something from the market. Yeah. So all these servants belong to the pharaohs and they would be in the tombs? Yeah, in the tombs to serve. But they believe that these uh, statues uh, become. Yeah, uh, become people after death to serve him. The afterlife was for everyone, for the pharaohs, for the upper class people, middle class people, lower people, servants. You know. Everyone built a tomb for his afterlife with what we, he has, with what he owned. They enjoyed life very much and because of this, they wanted the same life for, the, the, uh, for themselves in the afterlife. We often think of ancient Egyptians as propagating a cult of death. But unlike many other religions, they cherished the day to day. They weren't just waiting for the life hereafter. But when they went, they went in style. Only a pharaoh could have a boat as big as this in his tomb.
because they believed when the king gets up again, he can use, the, uh, use it to go to anywhere with the sea. So he can float down the Nile on this yeah, boat yeah. after death? Of course. <laughs> right. They believe that, yeah. We were born again after death. We found vegetables, food, corn, everything. Everything. Okay. So the idea was that life after death would be just as comfortable as life before death. You have all the things that you have on Earth, you put them in the tomb. Everything. Of course, life wasn't comfortable for everyone. And indeed, there was the revolution of 2000 BC, which was ultimately heeded by the pharaohs. In Egypt today, the pharaoh has stepped aside. But the current revolution continues on the square with yet another demonstration. An earlier revolution in Egypt in 1952, led by an army officer, Gamal Abdel Nasser, also took place on this square and gave it the name Tahrir, or Liberation Square. It's kind of quite wonderful that this is its name because it didn't start out being called Tahrir Square, or Liberation Square. It started out being called Ismailiya after Khedewi Ismail, who built it and who built um, modern, modern Cairo. And it was with the revolution of 52 that they changed the name to, to Liberation Square. And, um, and then it wasn't really liberated and... Uh, Until we, now. <laughs> and now. And now it is, yeah. Which is, which is nice. And I mean, somebody, somebody wrote that... Uh, that the revolution of uh, 52 was done by the army and supported by the people. And the revolution of uh, 2011 was a people's revolution and protected by the army. And all of it in Tahrir. I grew up under Nasser and we were very much encouraged then to look at ancient Egyptian history as very much alive and very much part of who we, we are, because of course Nasser was the first Egyptian to rule Egypt since the pharaohs. But Nasser's revolution didn't have the success he hoped for. But of course the powers that were arranged against him, you know, the West, uh, Israel, the reactionary Arab regimes. Yes. I mean, and if Nasser had been allowed, if you like, to, uh, you know, to, to succeed in yeah, his yeah, project, yeah, yeah. We would have been, I mean, the world would have been in a completely, completely right, um, different place now. It was under Nasser that the museum lost the land that linked it to the Nile. A government office block was built on it, the one that was burnt out in the revolution. You can see how ugly is this building. Well, it's been know, destroyed now. <laughs> which had been completely destroyed. We are asking for this land back. We need to have the museum seize the Nile again. You know, because this was one of the goals that they put the museum on this spot. The museum is the house of the treasures of the pharaohs, and the Nile was the life for the Egyptians. Look at the Nile. This is yeah. extraordinary oh, view you have from here, which is... It is. It's, I mean, from up here, it's the most beautiful place in the world. I, I believe I've been everywhere in the world. I haven't seen anything as beautiful as that. If we had not the Nile, we would not have Egypt at all. Not only Cairo. All of Egypt would not exist at all. Egypt exists because of this one river this wonderful river which we worship, which the ancient Egyptians worshipped also, because this is our life, this. Until Nasser came, until 1952, we were an agricultural country. We used to export our cotton and uh, rice and Absolutely. all sorts of food, yeah. everything. We were we, we had enough food for the whole population with no problem whatsoever. Today we import food. Egypt imports food, which is unheard of. We fed the whole world at one time. But Egypt has got poorer and poorer, hasn't it? The poorer have got poorer and poorer and poorer. Because they are more and more. It's a population count that is terrifying. I remember about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were 30 billion in all Egypt. And now 
there's 30 million people in Cairo, no matter what they tell you. It grows all the time.